Hi, my name is Nico Stuurman and I'm a research scientist in the lab of Ron Veil at UCSF. I co-developed an open source software package called Micromanager that uh, is built to acquire images uh, with microscopes. And here in this image analysis course, we really hope to give you an overview of everything you can do and what you should pay attention to with image analysis. And in this particular lecture, we're going to talk about where images are born, where they come from. And so we, of course, start with a microscope. We have an, an object, a cell. We have a uh, magnifying device, an uh, objective. And in the end, the goal here is to acquire um, data, shine light or collect light that comes from the sample and collect uh, numbers. Uh, and what I want you to get away with in the end is that we are going to care much more about those numbers than how good the picture looks. So the primary goal here is to collect numbers in a good way so that we can analyze them. And um, as a tool to do that, we do need to look at them. We need to visualize them on the screen. Uh, but it is not so much about this is not the end goal. The end goal is the analysis. The visualization is just a tool to a means. OK, so image acquisition, you will need software. You will need a computer for it. And part of the role that this computer and this computer software is going to play, um, our package micromanager is just an example. There are many, many different ones out there. What they do is, in part, is robotics. It's moving things. It's switching light sources on and off. It's doing that all in an orchestrated manner, where you, the user, are in control and tell it what program to, to play. Um, so, for instance, you will want the software to switch on a light source to start illuminating the sample. Uh, at that point, you can start, uh, your detector can start collecting the data. Once that collection of data is finished, you want the, the, the software to transfer those numbers back into the computer, so you get them in the computer's memory. Software will also do things as moving a Z stage so that you can take a through focus series. If you, you want it to, to change filters, to change illumination, you may want it to move the XY stage to take um, images at different positions. So the robotics is an important part, but I'm not going to talk much more about that. What we really care about is now the detector and uh, the numbers that it collects and how to do that in a faithful manner. So what kind of detectors are out there? Um, very quickly and very shortly, there, there are single point detectors, things like PMTs, uh, avalanche photodiodes that only measure light at a single point. So those are usually used in uh, confocal spot scanners. And they collect data really fast. You uh, image at many, many different points, and then the computer builds up an image. On the other hand, there are things like cameras that acquire lots of spatial elements all simultaneous. So they are more like parallel detectors. And recently, we're seeing kind of things in between that collect smaller areas really very fast. But in the end, what all these detectors do is that they, at a local spatial element, they collect photons for a specified amount of time, your exposure time, and convert that in electrons. And that is always through the, the photoelectric effect. One thing you care about there is the quantum yield. How well does your detector convert photons in electrons? Um, Every detector also has a noise aspect. There usually is an amplifier to amplify the signal. Uh, there will be noise associated with that. And eventually, there has to be some kind of conversion from an analog signal to a digital signal. So we go from an analog number, an analog uh, 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 entity, 
to a digital fixed number that now can be um, moved through computer memory without any loss whatsoever. And the AD converter, what's important is the range. So what kind of range of numbers does it need to deal with? And so all these different detectors, these principles are always at play. But the important thing to remember is what you're really measuring is photon flux. You measure the number of photons over a time unit. So photon flux. A um, couple of the important detector features, that noise that we talked about, it's kind of a fixed value that will always be added um, at, at every intensity value. And when you think about that a little bit, is that that noise, that noise in your detector, will determine the minimal meaningful step to go from one intensity level to the next. Then. There will always, there's an issue of a zero. So you would think, well, if I have zero photons, then my digital number should be zero. And in a way, you're right. But on the other hand, there's a problem there because the detector adds noise. And if you add noise over an average of zero, you end up with negative values. So that is, uh, you can, you could potentially accommodate those in computer memories but it's kind of very painful and uh, wasteful, so that is never done. And the solution to this is just to ramp up the zero a little bit so that the noise is actually visible. So whenever you see an image like this that is all black and is all zeros, you know there's something not right here because someone is hiding the detector noise from me and I need to know that. And so an image like this that may look like a lot of noise if that is your dark image, that is the good thing. And this is what you're looking for. Um, the range, the digital range, um, it of course should fit the range that your detector actually delivers. Um, so the maximum signal from your detector has to be caught in that range. But then the number of steps is determined by the noise, because that noise, as we in the previous slide talked about determines the step size. So the total digital range is going to be the maximum signal divided by the step size plus the offset. And so the range that is useful will depend on the detector and has very general rules. You know, those single point detectors, they're usually very fast, they collect only a very few photons, so often their dynamic range is relatively small. Uh, and so you can get away with a relatively low range of uh, intensities, whereas cameras are often have a very high dynamic range. And um, uh, so you can sometimes discriminate 1,000 to 50,000 or even more uh, grayscale va intensity values. So um, one thing that you would like to know, but that is often not available, is how to convert the digital number that you have to the original number of photons that was collected by the detector. Um, whenever you can find out, that number will depend on things like gain of the detector, um, but that really would give you a, a, a way to go back to a physical, meaningful intensity value rather than something relative. You will see in practice that you often work with relative changes. This is not absolutely essential but desirable. Now, we have numbers coming from the detector, so how are we going to display them? So we want to look at these numbers and often the simplest way is to just uh, put them on the display as a uh, uh, black, white, or gray images. And so, of course, how you do that depends on the range that you, is being delivered by the detector. So if you happen to have a detector that only has zeros and ones, so uh, it's a one bit in computer term with a range of two detector, then the most straightforward way is to do blacks and whites, and it will immediately be very obvious what is zero and one. And this is what we call a binary image. You will not often collect images this way, but you will see later on that this is a very important concept in, in um, 
analyzing images. So when you have more grayscale values, and that uh, in computer lingo we often go in bits, so two bits gives you a range of four, four bits gives you a range of 16, etc. Um, so you will notice now that when you have more than eight bits, we don't really see any difference anymore in the grayscale value. And that is because the monitors and the computer screens that we work with um, basically almost always have only eight bits of dynamic range. So going from black to white, there are only 256 grayscale values. So if your detector delivers more, you cannot look at them at one and the same time. Now, and that is a bit of an issue, and an issue you will need to deal with. Um, and there are various ways of doing it. And so, a, a very useful concept is to think about lookup tables. So basically, when an image, and this is the primary data, has certain numbers, we can now start assigning um, grayscale values to those numbers, and the most natural thing for this two-bit image is to just make a gradient from black to white, and that gives us an image that looks like this little spot here. But now let's, for instance, say that we know that this is a little dot of uh, green fluorescent protein, and we really like it to be green. So then you say, well, fine, I'm just gonna make my colors now green instead of uh, black and white, and then it looks green. Nothing changes with the numbers here, only the way you display it. And you can go totally wild, and you can make all kinds of other funky color schemes. And these ones here um, don't look super useful to me. There are definitely others that are very useful, but actually when you think about it, like, you know, it may be hard to see the black here, and by uh, making zero value red, you immediately see that there's, there's stuff there, that there is, that there are pixels there. Or for instance, there's no number two in this set of numbers. And with these three uh, lookup tables, that's immediately obvious because there's no blue or uh, orange in, uh, in any of these images. So you can really use these lookup tables to your advantage. Now, things get more interesting when you have um, images that have a much wider range of possible values than your display. So the natural thing is to do what we've done so far. You set zero to black and you set the brightest value to white, 256 on the monitor. And then you will see in a real image that is uh, collected with a 16-bit sensor, it can very well happen that you see barely anything. Now, the tool that most software packages should have is shown here. So there are, and it's kind of a combination. It's a combination of a histogram. So this histogram has on the x-axis the uh, intensity values as delivered by the uh, detector, and on the y-axis the number of pixels with that given intensity value. So that histogram is an incredibly important tool because it lets you look very quickly at what the intensity values in your image actually are. It also lets you very quickly adjust the display because often you will want to set the blacks to be the lowest value in the image rather than zero and it wants you to set the white, the brightest, to the highest value in the image. Also note that actually the minimum and the maximum and even the mean are, are displayed here. And this is something that many software packages will do for you. And there's a trick here because since it's software, it can do boring stuff for you directly. So we could move these sliders and change the brightness and contrast basically of the image. But we can also say auto stretch. And when I do that, it will automatically set these little triangles, the, the white and the black point in the image and give me an you know, what usually is pretty optimal display onto the image. Note here that almost all the possible pixel values that the detector could deliver are actually being shown as white. So the full dynamic range that we use is pretty small, yet this is the, 
a, a dynamic range that is present in our pixel values. That's the stuff we care about. Um, now, there are all kinds of tricks you can play with these uh, tools. So often, it is useful to, um, to look at rare uh, values in your histogram. So you uh, often want to use a log scale, a logarithmic scale for your y-axis, so that the rare bright pixels actually stand out and you can see them. You may want to... Uh, scale the x-axis so that you actually get a little bit of a better view on, on uh, what pixel values you have there. Again, we're not changing any of the original values here. We're only uh, changing how uh, we look at them. Then there are uh, interesting lookup tables that you can assign and often um, uh, a very useful one is to highlight pixels that are bright and pixels that are dark. So here we're setting the, the top 0.1% of the pixels to red and we see some kind of structure in the cell here that is red and we see that uh, the top 1% of the dark pixels are setting blue so we kind of see the noise here in the dark areas. Um, and one important lesson here when you're acquiring images is that to maximize the information content, you want to maximize the use of that histogram. So the previous image, um, I used the five milliseconds exposure. For this one, I switched to 150 milliseconds and I got a way wider dynamic range. And even though the image looks almost the same as the previous one, this is the one I want to do my analysis on because the information content is much larger than in the previous one. Now, um, to, um, uh, it, of course, this has the downside that if your sample photo bleaches, then you don't want to be doing this. Uh, so you always, you know, you, you have to live with your sample and you have to live with uh, the limitations that are imposed by your biological object. But if you can and uh, you want to optimize the, the content of your image and so to maximize your information content. Um, one thing that we often do when we are acquiring multiple images uh, under different illumination settings, so uh, multiple channels. So here, for instance, we had an image from a fixed slide with where the, the nuclei were stained with DAPI and blue uh, and um, actin uh, stress fibers were stained with a green dye and we had mitochondria stained in red. So often you will want to look at those overlays. So the first thing would then be to use these colored lookup tables on them. So we now get the blue nuclei and the green actin and the red mitochondria. And then you can overlay the, those in one image and then you get things that often look very pretty, but that also lets you see how things are located with respect to each other. So this will be a very common technique in all acquisition software. There's one thing to remember and that there are a, a certain percentage of people who, can, who are red, green, colorblind. And so if you're sharing these images, it really is useful to use colorblind friendly uh, colors. And there are all kinds of resources out there to help you select those. Now, when you're acquiring things like multiple uh, Z positions, uh, multiple XY positions, or time lapses, the way that is often represented in a computer memory is that these are stacks of images, and you will have some kind of tool, a viewer, that lets you go through those. So here, I have a um, time lapse image taken at different Z positions, and when we uh, now scroll through Z, you see that with changing the focal position, we uh, look, uh, we get an uh, idea about the three-dimensional organization, and then we can play a time-lapse image of this. Um, this is actually a Drosophila S2 cell with an ER label and uh, in mitosis, and you saw in the time-lapse how uh, that behaves. One 
so in general, I hope you got the message that uh, it is not good to change those pixel values that you acquired. There's one before you start analyzing them. There's one possible uh, exception to that, and that is um, correcting for your illumination. So this is an example of what the so-called flat field image looks like. If we just look only at the way we illuminate our sample in the microscope, and you can see that points in the center here are much brighter than points in the corners here. So if you have cells and you want to compare their intensities, and you have cells here and cells here, just by virtue of the illumination, the ones here are going to be brighter than the ones here. So comparing their intensities would, wouldn't make any sense because you're comparing illumination intensity rather than the endogenous level of whatever you're interested in. Likewise, there is a background coming from your, sen uh, your sensor. Usually that is much more homogeneous, so you're, you're, you're pretty good in that. But if you can, one way or another, measure that illumination profile and know your background, you can correct for it. And the way to do that is, well, your, your real image is going to be the object that you're interested in, multiplied by the illumination, the illumination intensity, at every pixel, with the background added. And so, to uh, now get your object out of this, it is simply swapping this uh, equation. Your object will be the image that you measured, minus the background, divided by the illumination intensity. And so this is something that you could want to be doing right away, although even then there are some rounding issues. Um, were it not for those rounding issues, you could always revert it and get back to your image. This is also something you can do after the fact, but you'll definitely will be wanting to do this before doing any further quantification of your images. We've talked a lot about pixels, about intensity data, um, and I want to shortly introduce to you the concept of metadata. It's of course not only those intensity measurements. Those intensity measurements are the most important part, I would say. But there are, of course, you know, for your computer to do anything with this, it will need to know, first of all, okay, I have this string of bytes. What does this represent? So the very first thing is like, well, this is the way I store my numbers. I have like one byte per pixel or two bytes per pixel. These are um, unsigned integers or floating point numbers. So, so the computer has to settle on how to imp interpret that byte stream. It has to know simple stuff like, okay, what is the width and height? Because otherwise it can never reconstruct that image for you again. Then there are metadata. So for instance, in our time lapse, we want to know, okay, which plane is which time point? What was the interval between these time points? Which plane is what position? What illumination did you use? Et cetera, et cetera. So there's the, the kind of logistics of what this all meant. Um, and that has to travel with your image or you're gonna be lost. Then there's a whole lot of information about the equipment that you used to acquire this data. And so for instance, in the uh, micromanager software, we record all that information, a lot of it very boring that you will never look at it again, but some of them are very important, like you know, the pixel size, what did this um, pixel physically represent in sample space. Um, so it is important, and it's important to keep that with your uh, images. And then there are um, what I call here experiment metadata. What was this sample? What drugs did I use on it? Um, uh, what do I actually want to achieve with this experiment, etc., etc. And we will talk about metadata and, and how to keep and store and use them uh, in another lecture in this series. One important thing to consider is that these data sets of images tend to grow. They can get very, very, very big. So we are now routinely in the lab using cameras that have 
2000 by 2000 pixels, two bytes per pixel, so every plane, every image has eight megabytes. Now when you, you know, do a simple time lapse that um, we may be doing, where you have two channels, 80 slices, you get 1.3 roughly gigabytes for every time point. And if you run that for a day, you get close to two terabytes of data. So that is a lot to deal with, to move it around, to store it. Um, uh, usually I'm the one in the lab who's dealing with it and the graduate students and postdocs don't know what is going on, but you know, just to help people like me, plus yourself, later on because you will deal with this at one point or another. You know, think about this and try to reduce the size of the images you take to the absolute minimum necessary to do your analysis. So if you can just use a low resolution and still get the results out that you're actually interested in, please do it. Don't go to the beautiful high resolution images just because they look cool. Um, you will regret that later. And so just as an example, this is an image taken with a uh, 40x objective. If I were to be just interested in the size of these cells, kind of the outline of it, I would do way better using a 5x objective where I get a 64-fold larger field of view in one image of the same size as with the 40x, but see how many more data points I get in one shot. So use the lowest resolution possible. The end of all of this is that you're going to save your data one way or another. So you're going to save your pixels and your metadata for further analysis. There are many different file formats and we will be talking about some of this later on uh, in, in other um, uh, uh, recordings in this series. An important concept to remember is um, lossy uh, uh, and lossless saving. So lossy basically means that you are throwing away data to reduce file size. So all our cameras that we have in our phones or SLRs, they tend to save in this file format called JPEG that has been optimized to preserve what we with our eyes consider as important. But that may not necessarily be what our analysis considers important. So once you start saving in one of these formats, you basically lost your pixel data. And in a way, that's the end of it for analysis. You're never going to get them back. So don't do that if you want to do further analysis. Now, there are many different formats for lossless saving. Um, you will always get to these uh, TIFF kind of formats, which is kind of more or less the universal format at the moment to exchange data. And um, this all will be touched upon in, in later, um, in, in other recordings. For now, What's important is to know how your software saves the data and you want to be absolutely sure that it's lossless and you want to be sure that it is in a way that you can work with it again in your analysis software. And that brings me uh, to the end. So I hope that you now are convinced that your digital images are numbers with metadata and that you are responsible for keeping those intact and keeping them in a way that actually faithfully represent what you were recording and do it in a way so that you can analyze them further. And I want to do a short shout out to Kurt Thorne. Um, he and I have done ver several versions of similar kind of presentations and we've um, really uh, helped each other a lot with this. So thank you, Kurt. <laughs>